Greetings, everyone. My name is Stephen Neely. I am your co-host for the virtual Dalcros Meetup. I'm here with my dear friends and colleagues, Emma Shubin and Veronica Bileski. Uh, and we are your organizing team and hosts uh, for meetup number 65. That's craziness. Wow. It's crazy that we could have, uh, that we have 64 prior hours um, logged in our archives um, at virtualdalcros.org. Uh, and today we get another great one. I'm super excited um, to have my dear friend, uh, Dr. Eisenreich with us here today. Um, and, and we've got all sorts of fun uh, stuff to get into. Before we do that though, we're gonna do our normal uh, getting to know you two minute breakout. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna throw everybody into breakout rooms really fast. And all I want you to do is to say hi to whoever's in the room. And um, can you please introduce yourself Tell us where you're located and tell us who do you teach or who do you work with or who do you want to work with or who do you aspire to work with um, or what do you do? Some version of that. But the general normal things are your name, where are you located and who do you teach? Um, you get only two minutes today. So it's going to go super fast and then you got to come back. You ready, set, one, hold on. And uh, go. People coming back from the breakout room with smiles, it's always the right thing. We always know whatever you are up to out there, I guess it paid off in some good ways. Um, Veronica, uh, you wanna help us with, um, I, we got some announcements, I think. Oh, you're muted. Um, I posted an agenda. Um, I keep reposting it in case people join after uh, the first post. Um, so we just, announced our new season schedule and so if you go to that first link um, we have a handful more of meetups uh, over the next four months no six months <laughs> um, so those are all published on the VDM calendar um, and also if you click on those um, cards on the right hand side it'll take you to a link that's a printable schedule as well um, and then we have uh, new master classes coming up um, and so the first one is um, Arthur Similis, um, and that's right at the end of January. Um, I don't know if Emma or Stephen would like to say a little bit about Arthur's teaching. Emma? Oh, man, y'all don't want to miss this. He's one of the youngest um, recent diplomates. He is the most extraordinary piano player. He's a wonderful improviser, player of jazz of all genres, but he's just a lovely human and has great ideas and his attitude is infectious and you're gonna have a good time. Like I s got to know him within four and a half seconds, decided we were best friends for life. And I think everybody feels that way about him. And he just has this beautiful way of working with and collaborating even over the Zoom waves as it were. So I don't miss it because um, also to hear somebody like make music at that level, and we are a good community of great music makers. And I still, I don't think I've ever quite heard something like that before. So it's, its he's gonna be great. You don't wanna miss it. Wow, we are so excited about this particular masterclass series. Um, two of the other people, Sylvie and Tame, are both um, live in Switzerland, in Geneva. Um, Sylvie just retired as the, and I don't, I'm gonna get her title slightly wrong, but she was sort of the person in charge of the diploma program. So she was, you know, teaching, um, teaching all the fancy students coming through for many years. Um, I met her a million years ago um, during undergrad, where she came and studied at Carnegie Mellon with Marta Sanchez for a year. And she's just a brilliant musician and the nicest person and has years and years and years of experience uh, doing this work. And so um, I'm thrilled that we got her to say yes and come and lead. And Tamei is also a new diplom. And um, and I saw I met her for the first time just this summer um, at the Congress in Geneva. And I was so excited about her teaching. I immediately said, would you please come do a, um, a masterclass for us? And then um, we have Fumiko Honda, um, who lives, Fumiko Honda Bauer, who lives in the States, originally from Japan. Um, and she's someone that um, our early, my and her early Dalcos training overlapped at Carnegie Mellon many years ago. Um, and she's just another outstanding musician um, who, uh, uh, who has now specialized in working with young children. And so we're really excited to feature her and to introduce her to a wider audience. 
And then uh, along with the master classes um, is we have a short course by my dear friends who in my screen are on either side of me, Veronica and Emma, um, who uh, we finally talked into offering a short course, um, this one in entrepreneurship, um, thinking about Dalcro's classes and ways that we might be able to include any of this kind of work in the community. So how do you start new courses? How do you uh, attract new students? How do you keep people coming back? Um, what are financial models? Um, all sorts of attentions dealing with how do you start a small business really, um, but a business of the kind of things that we all might do. Um, do either of you wanna say a little more to what I just said to that course? Or did I do okay? Nailed it, nailed it. They are we're gonna, we're gonna they're have good time. teaching, um, I know, and I, I've seen uh, preview copies of some of their agenda, um, and they have it all kind of worked out, like who's doing what, what weeks, and when are they together, and when is it one or the other. Um, it's it's going to be, it's already a very well planned out course, uh, and uh, we have two uh, experts in the field who have run community-based programs for many years, have learned a lot of lessons um, and uh, and know some things. So I encourage all of you who are thinking, well, maybe there's a chance that I would start my own course or offer my, my new class. Nobody teaches X in this town. Maybe I could be the one who would offer that. How do you sort of break into the market and get things going? These are two people who really have spent a lot of time thinking about that. Maybe if I would add one thing, it's it's, what you just reminded me of, Stephen, it's that the lessons learned of like, oh, I wish I had known this when I first started. I think that's the thing that we're hoping to share. So I hope everybody will uh, register for all of the above uh, and we'll be excited to have you. Um, well, I think we're at the spot where I get to introduce uh, Cassandra. So um, we, um, Dr. Eisenreich and I um, have been close friends for a really long time. Also, our early Dalkers training overlapped at Carnegie Mellon a, a many years ago. Um, we live sort of in the same area of, of Pennsylvania and uh, on occasion get to trade classrooms or share students or just overlap with each other. Um, I am in awe of this woman and all the things that she does and has been able to do and how many things she's able to keep going uh, at once. The work is always inspiring. And and so we. this isn't the first time that Cassandra's come to the virtual Dalcros meetup, um, but it's been too long. And so we wanted to invite her back and just say, tell us what you've been doing. Um, and I think with that, Cassandra Eisenreich, everyone. Um, Cassandra, the, the floor is yours for 15 or 20 minutes, whatever you whatever you would like. Great. I'm going to share my screen. Um, nice to uh, to be here. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I am, am I able to share my screen? Did you did somebody? Let's see here. It should work. Hmm. If it doesn't, just let me. Oh, there it goes now. OK. Well, um, I figured I would start by telling you a little bit about what I do, just to give you some context, and I'll um, do it very briefly. And I do have two students here who um, have been involved in um, in these programs in multiple ways. Uh, so I would love for them to kind of definitely join in the conversation in a bit and kind of share their experience from the student perspective, because I think that's uh, really important. So as Stephen said, I'm Cassandra Eisenreich. I teach at Slippery Rock University. Um, and at Slippery Rock, I'm on the music ed faculty, and I also teach flute. On the music ed side of things, um, my focus is general music. So I do early childhood um, and general music all the way through um, middle school. And um, in addition to that, I'm the director and lead teacher for um, our early childhood and elementary music community engagement initiative, which is something that I started when I got to Slippery Rock that has it's the umbrella term for many, um, many other things, which I, I can show you um, briefly. But if you wanna kind of check out what we're doing, if you're on social media, you can check out our pages on Facebook and Instagram there, and you can see videos and photos and things from our classes and events. Whoops. Okay, so really quickly, um, all of the programs that we have, I mean, when I say programs, we run several weekly classes um, where we meet with preschool students for 30 minutes once a week. 
I run one of those classes with a group of our music education students. It's actually now built into our programming, which is really exciting, um, into our curriculum. So students are required to have this experience. Um, which is nice. And um, in addition, uh, I wanted to be able to reach the entire preschool. So after students go through my field experience, um, they are essentially interviewing for a job position. And I've received grants to pay students to then run their own classes, co-teach um, their own classes, which is really exciting. And Rachel is one of them who's here on the, uh, on the call. But when I, when I set this up, I thought, well, how do I how do I keep everything organized and consistent so everybody is getting more or less the same type of class? Um, and so I wanted to come up with an outline that was you know, flexible enough to be, um, so students could use their own individual creativity um, to develop lesson plans the way that, you know, that, that really resonated with them and the students that they were teaching. So I came up with the title of, of all of our um, classes to be Sing, Move, Play. Um, and I know for us, you know, when we're talking about your rhythmics, movement is something that we're all really focused on. But the importance of um, singing, especially in early childhood and developing the voice and using manipulatives. So the play aspect is um, playing actual instruments. So we know for tiny humans, um, their first instrument is usually after their voice, tiny percussion instruments where you're striking, shaking, scraping using other manipulative manipulatives like scarves and balls and things like that. Um, and all of these primary sing, move, play, all of these primary areas can kind of, you know, melt into one another. Just because you're singing doesn't mean you, you, you don't have to, you shouldn't be moving or just because you're moving doesn't mean that's the only aspect of what you should be doing. So there's obviously some flexibility in that, but the importance of, having children sing, move, and play in every class is at the root of what we're, um, what we're doing. So a couple of really interesting things that I thought would be um, worth mentioning. These classes are 30 minutes, and that looks like a lot of stuff happening in 30 minutes. Um, but each main activity, sing, move, and play, those activities are each about five minutes. So I always relate it to the child's age. If I'm working with a five-year-old, an activity that I'm doing in each of these categories is gonna be no longer than five minutes. If I want it to be longer than five minutes for some reason, I need to change the way that I'm introducing it or you know, the types of things that I'm doing within that activity to keep their attention. So attention span related to age is something that I think is really powerful. And I think that goes for college students as well. <laughs> it's like after 20, after 20 minutes, we're gone. Um, so anyways, I think that's something interesting I wanted, I wanted to, um, to bring up. And the other thing that I thought would be um, valuable and worth mentioning um, are transitions. So you see that I have um, the hello song and the goodbye song that sandwich the meat of the, um, of, the, of the sandwich. So sing, move, play is your meat. But then we have these transitions and I think, um, you know, sometimes that's where we can lose our sense of classroom management. Uh, it's like, okay, we're done with this activity and now we have to do this activity. Or we have all of these manipulatives or instruments on the ground and we have to find a way to clean them up and be able to move on to the next activity efficiently. And transitions will make or break that fluidity, that flow. Um, but it can also um, be a really supportive element in providing another musical experience. Um, and so I'm curious, I just want to stop for a moment and ask, does anybody have some transitions or I would say um, focus activities that um, they use in their classrooms with uh, children that are really powerful? And I can share just as an example, I can share, um, you know, when I trans, if I want the students to stand up, Instead of saying, okay, we're all gonna stand up now, why not make that a musical experience? Rise way high, way up to the sky. Or I'll play it on piano, or I'll play it on another instrument. And they know even without the text that I'm singing, they know that that upward scale means to stand up. And that's something that's very Dow Crows that many of us are already familiar with. But I'm interested in hearing maybe just taking a few, um, like a minute here to 
to share some of those transition or um, focus activities now. I have a bunch that I could share, but I'm, I know that you all work with children, so. Um, I'm happy to share one. Yeah. Um, that I actually learned from Emma, um, and it is just a perennial favorite. Uh, it's the, it's like when the kids are overactive and they just need a break, they all lie down on the floor and they sleep and I play sleeping music. And then I just play an accented low note that wakes them up. And when they're, when they hear that, instead of shouting, they have to go shh as if they're shushing me because I woke them up. And you know, this game works so beautifully with young kids, like four and five, but these kids remember this game even when they're nine and 10 and they beg me to play it when they're nine and 10. <laughs> and that essentially serves as classroom, a classroom management activity. That's a focus activity because you're getting them. It's, it's a little wild or it could work both ways. If the kids are wild or if the kids are tired, it could mm -hmm. It can service you in 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 both ways. Um, great, yeah. So, like a focus activity. What else? Anyone else have uh, like an, another example of a transition activity would be like the cleanup song. So when you're singing, the kids know the cleanup song. Many of you are probably familiar with one that has circled um, widely, but in in you know um, early childhood classrooms, but. Clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. Clean up, clean up, everybody do your share. We sing it a couple of times and they know by the time we're done singing, the instruments are put away and they're back in their position in the circle. Um, other thoughts? The um, I haven't been working with little kids for, for some years now, um, but I've been talking with our colleague, uh, Anthony Molinaro. So I'll, 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 you know, a couple of Anthony's little things. Um, Anthony plays a fun game called uh, Master of Stillness, um, where he'll just pull it out and, and he would have to be here to tell us exactly when he employs it, but it's a transitional thing. It's not actually the content of, a, of an exercise. And, but as he's finishing one thing, one thing he sometimes will call is he'll just call her out master of stillness and all the students will freeze and then they're trying to see who can be most still and and then he looks as though he's seeing oh i saw you twitch i saw you twitch and then he'll name a student as the as the master of stillness for the moment and then that student gets to be the first to do whatever the next thing is whether it's the end of class and they go put on their shoes or they're the person who gets to go pick up the hula hoop that's the the thing that everyone wishes they got to touch first and so he'll sometimes call that and then other times later in the class He'll, he'll say, who was master of stillness today? And they'll all go, oh, it was Nate. And then, and then, and he says, all right, well then Nate gets to whatever. So he doesn't only use it once, sometimes he'll use it multiple times. And it's super powerful. That one is super powerful. I've seen him do that and the kids love it and it's perfect for classroom management. <laughs> go ahead, Emma. I was gonna jump in and now I lost my train of thought. I was just gonna say, I've <clears throat> seen Anthony do that and st stolen that one as well um because he really he like makes sure to remember between classes also who was master of stillness ah now i got it he often will pick the kiddo that's having the hardest time as the master of stillness i've seen him also use it in that way at least and we've talked about it and like shared a little bit like sometimes if somebody's having a really hard time he'll like really help that person feel like oh yeah i'm getting the attention but for doing the right thing instead of doing the wrong thing because oh. positive reinforcement is always stronger than negative. Positive reinforcement is always going to move them to make better choices. Um, yeah. And then the other thing I'll say, so if you're, if, um, and everybody has their bag of tricks for these transitions or focus activities. Um, and sometimes they don't have to be so thought out. For instance, in our sing move plays, we usually have a theme. Now I know some people are, um, well, that's a whole nother story. We don't have time to get into that. But for instance, if our theme is transportation that day and we sing a song about, you know, riding on down to grandpa's farm and we're pretending with hula hoops and we're singing instead of after singing, just asking them to stand up or even singing my my scale going up, you know, what's something, and I'm going to ask Rachel or Nate, what's something we could do? What's a transitional experiential story we could take from singing 
to movement in that theme. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to necessarily be with song or music per se, but how can you get from one to the next? I, hang on, what are we what are we going from? You kind of just uh, cut up a little bit. You're going from um, where our theme is transportation and maybe we're at the farm and we're singing a song about being at grandpa's farm. And then we need to get from singing to movement. What's something we could do to transition? Well, you can become movement of different farm animals. Sure. Sure. All right, everybody. Let's get our binoculars out and let's see what animals we can find. <gasps> I see so-and-so animal. Great. Do we all see that animal? Let's move like that animal over to our new space or whatever. It, it can be something that simple. But starting with play-based imaginative experiences in your transitions will keep the energy and the wonder alive. And it's so powerful to make that transition a magical one versus just we're on to the next thing. Um, so I, I really wanted to highlight the importance of age and time and also the importance of musical transitions or focus activities and or um, you know imaginative ones that keep the magic. So um, I wanted to jump into um, Right after the hello song, you see um, vocal warm up, body warm up, steady beat warm up. Sometimes in my sing move plays, I do all three of those after the hello song. And sometimes I do them right before each activity. So for instance, I do the hello song, which is the same every week. And then I go to the vocal warm up. And when I say that, um, some sometimes people think, oh, okay, we're singing. Um, La 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 bum ba la 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 and that's not what we're doing with early childhood um and elementary students we could but we're really working um for the child to stay in their head voice we want children singing in their head voice whether they're moving or not um it's important for their vocal development to stay up there um and when children speak you notice that their voices are higher you know, and so it's important that we match where that in terms of range, where their natural speaking voice is, and that is best for them. Um, that's a, a good starting point. So when I say vocal warm up, what are some things I know that, that you know, this is movement, you know, we're going to be talking a lot more about movement, but I'm wondering what are some things you all do vocally? Do you do any vocal warm ups? Are there any things that you like? Could you share? about sirens, like just making high, low sounds just to- Yeah, and how could we make that more play-based and student-led? Student I'm trying to think of a good story. The, uh, the tie it to something, right? Uh, yeah. I'm trying to avoid like ambulances and- uh, and sound. But, you know, and kids, lo they love the fire trucks and they love the ambulances. And I think um, even if you- <gasps> Do you see, there's an ambulance coming down, whatever. Ima again, playful, imaginative, it really um, it really engages them. And so when you're doing, um, you know, kids will want to be kids. And so if you're doing sirens, they might want to scream. They might want to, um, one thing that I introduced, especially in early childhood, the difference between our singing voice, our speaking voice, our whispering voice and our yelling voice. And anytime we say the word yell, we just put a big old X. And so if you approach it at the beginning, these are our main three voices. This is one we don't use. Um, kids will be kids and then we bring them back in. But the playful element of what you just said, Stephen, go ahead, well, what were you gonna say? I'm also thinking about echoes, you know, sort of like I make a sound, you make a sound and mm -hmm. so back and forth and then maybe at some point allowing a student or multiple students to take the turn as the leader of the echo. Yeah. Sort of established, establish the space that you're working with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with really tiny learners, an echo can be like four-year-olds echoing as, 
something that needs to be developed over time. I mean, it happens, but usually like the tinies, the four-year-olds and the five-year-olds learn through immersion. So you sing a song a lot and then they pick it up. Just like, it's always interesting in my methods classes. I'm like, tell me what, at what point in your life did you learn the song happy birthday? when did somebody teach you happy birthday nobody ever taught you happy birthday you learned it through immersion and so they get that um and they understand that you know with that analogy what other vocal warm-ups um i love especially since i have a lot of tiny tiny babes um for example if we have little resonator bells we'll do a little telephone game like hello hello oh is that cassandra Oh, my interrupting class. Okay, goodbye. Can we all say goodbye? Goodbye. So we'll like, I'll give everybody one and five, and then we'll all practice going, oh, goodbye. Yeah. Or if they're a bit older, little games where like we do, how do you do? Like we'll do things like that. Yeah. And so that, so that has a name that that's called Arioso. And so, um, and there are different levels of Arioso. So Arioso is kind of like, um, where you could, and it's great if you have, if you use a Socratic approach, like you said, where you're asking questions. Hey, everybody, how are you today? What did you have for dinner? Now you can start with that one five, or you can be as melodic as you want because you're serving as the role model. And then there will be levels of children. There's your level one where they will say, last night I had macaroni and cheese and it was great. And then you'll have like some savants who are like, last night I had macaroni and cheese. And it doesn't have to be, we want to work to being in a key. We want to work for that. you know, my, the students that we are working with are not, um, they don't have music. They wouldn't have had music if it wasn't for us. And um, and so these are their first experiences. And so just singing, just using their singing voice and being able to move through pitches and identify that they are in fact using one voice versus the other um, is kind of where, where we are. Um, but then moving to, okay, I'm going to sing an outline of the one, I'm going to use ario so in the outline of a one chord and then i'm going to do one and five and and see how they pick it up and they learn it very quickly um another way to kind of dive off of that and they don't have any here but having i'll just give you an example here pretend there aren't any words here having a book with just pictures and asking hey emma what's happening on this photo and you just sing what you see and there are no wrong answers and that you don't have to be in a key or anything um so that's super fun i'll show you one more and then i'll move on these are really great printed them out so you could see them i guess i could have put them on my slide but um where you you start in one area and the children trace with their, their voices Also using yarn, this is probably their favorite and creating roller coasters. So, um, you know, they they essentially create what basically looks like that and they trace it with their fingers and that's, then you're pulling from what they're interested in and what they're creating and it's a ton of fun. Are they laying the yarn? Are they laying the yarn out in two dimensions on the floor? Is mm -hmm. that what you mean? Yeah, so they put the yarn on the ground essentially and just create a shape with it and then they trace it going up and down you can call it roller coasters you can call it hills usually roller coasters is a big hit with with my kiddos so we like going on roller coasters um okay so um uh, i want to show you one more um i don't know if anyone's familiar with these so these are essentially um again just to warm up your voice but they're um basically kind of call and response things. So anytime you hear the word, um, anytime you hear something good that happens, you say, oh, right. And anytime you hear something not so good that happens, you say, oh no. And so you're working on these, um, you know, just kind of warming up your voice. And it's a story about an airplane Um, an airplane ride and how a man went up in an airplane all right but the man didn't have an engine oh no but he had a parachute all right and so cute things like that that 
um, you can also just recreate, you know, create your own stories. Um, anyways, okay, so I want to move on to uh, just something with Sing in terms of creating with my students. I'm just going to click on this really quickly and show you with my college students in our methods classes. Um, are any of you familiar with the Know Better, Do Better project? So I would encourage you to kind of check it out. If you're not familiar, um, if you use a lot of children's folk music, that's wonderful. I would just encourage you to double and triple check the music that you use, whether you're playing it on piano or singing, um, you know, whatever, using it for movement, because a lot of children's um, literature is actually rooted in racism. And if we know better, we do better. And so um, the Know Better, Do Better project is about writing your own original song to replace a song that has been historically racist. So um, for instance, here's a song that um, one of my students, Ben Jameson wrote, Five Little Birds to replace 10 Little Indians. If you know the tune, 10 Little Indians. And so- Five little birdies sitting in a tree, wishing they could fly and touch the sky. Mama bird comes and says, it's time. One by one, they're all gonna try. And so you can listen to any of these on our YouTube channel. But the whole point is that um, I'm trying to foster creativity with my college students to then use in um, the, the classroom. Okay, so let me stop the share. And um, I'm interested to hear um, when you, how many of you actually have your your kids sing in in the classroom? Okay, and are you using traditional, are you using traditional songs from like the children's literature? Are you writing the songs? What's what's happening with that? A mix. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, good. That's great. That's great. Um, so one, I'm going to move to play and show you just how a song that exists, how you can take that and alter it to include student creativity. So I'm going to share my screen again. And we'll jump to play. Share sound. Okay, move out of the way, there we go. Okay, so let's go to play here. Are any of you familiar with um, the Toolbox song? Okay, so you can imagine that the Toolbox song is a song um, where you're talking about different tools, right? And if you're talking about different tools, you're talking about di children creating different movements. Um, in order to warm up for this, I usually do some sort of steady beat activity. So what are some transitional steady beat activity things we might be able to do to transition into play? Again, play is playing instruments, tiny percussion instruments. So what's something we might be able to do if we've already passed out the instruments? To warm up the steady, a steady beat. Um, I don't know the answers exactly that you're looking for, but I'm thinking, um, I was first picturing how we go get the instrument, but if they already have the instrument, then maybe the instrument is not in hand, but I'm doing something that is like playing the instrument without the instrument in hand. So mm -hmm. either or finding steady pulse in my body in any way. So maybe that's tapping my lap or or maybe clapping my hands or touching my shoulders or finding some little sort of like bodied choreography. Um, yeah, exactly. So in, in your rhythmics, we're always used to saying, you know, put it someplace else right? Find the beat and put it someplace else. Um, with children, it's always interesting because they'll always have their defaults. So they're going to want to clap their hands. 
They're going to want to tap their knees. And what's one way that we could use a Socratic method? So asking them questions to make a new choice. So where else can Besides we go? just saying, put it someplace else or do something different. Well, I mean, we could say where else could we place it? Um, mm -hmm. But then I don't know what else is more than that. What do we think? What else could we? It's so interesting because we we it's so easy for us to just push our agenda. Like we want we want to do this. Um, so if a kid is clapping their hands, right? There are different ways that we could clap our hands, right? Different places we could clap our hands. We could clap our hands behind us, right? Um, and so we could use the questioning techniques to ask them, you know, you, right now, are your hands high or low? Oh, well, they're kind of in the middle. Can you choose a new place that's higher? And so we're working with opposites, you know? Can you clap softer? Can you clap louder? Um, you know, without saying just do this or do that, but using, again, questioning techniques to guide their choices. Um, a lot of times kids will tap their, like they'll tap their head and we'll say, great, that looks great. Can we, can we use the other hand, you know, can we alternate, you know, what's something we always want to use our hand that our dominant hand kids will want to do that all the time. So encouraging them to have the same experience on the other in the other hand or in the other foot or alternating that bilateral coordination, all of that um, really, really makes a difference. Um, and so when we're doing the toolbox song, I taught this to one of my students and then they started, I, I observed them teaching it to students. And so they did a great job of saying, hey, what's the next tool? Like, what tool do you wanna do, right? And a kid said, oh, I wanna do the hammer. And one of my teachers said, okay, well, this is, this is, okay. So put your hammer out and hammer it down. What might be a better, it's not wrong, but what might be a better choice when you're working with children and you're trying to foster creativity? You can let them decide how they want to use the hammer. You don't have to say. Is your hammer <laughs> look? Yeah, exactly. Because they, they might have a big old hammer. We don't know. They might have a tiny little hammer. And again, you can use questioning techniques. Does your hammer look the same? Wow, I really like Nate's hammer. Can we all hammer like Nate? Which is a very Dow Crozian thing to do, to watch and see what they're doing. Um, and it's a very, I think, higher ed academia thing for us to do to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm supposed to do it this way. And so this is the way I'm gonna tell kids we're gonna hammer on the beat and that seems great. And it is, and it's fine. But could it be more student-centered? Could we be better observers and use our questioning techniques to help guide them? Um, yeah, and so it was interesting. You know, we 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 have our agenda. We want to show the students, okay, we're going to do this. Now a saw looks like this. It's very Del Crozy and Frested. Look at a kid and say, oh, well, that's great. Can everybody try doing it the way he or she is doing it? Right. Um, so now I'd like to go to um, move, the one that everybody's been waiting for. Um, one um, area of fostering creativity in my college students that I use for move, and this is something as teachers, you all can, um, I'm sure you've done in some way or another since you're Dow Crozian people. Um, if you have some sort of idea for um, a theme, for instance, we part of one of our partnerships is with the um, fiddlesticks programming for children with the Pittsburgh Symphony, and um, we run the Eurythmics room there. And we are trying to find a way that it would make it would seem like our movement activities would kind of coexist with what they're what they're doing in the concert. And so, two of my students, one who is on this call, um, Nate. Um, the idea, and I have them do this for their um, methods class as well, is for them to create a story. Now, even though they're creating the story, that doesn't mean that that story can't be flexible um, when they're actually with children. But here's an example of a story that takes children through, I'll just play a little bit of the beginning, that takes children through different movement activities in a play-based environment. 
and take a walk. Get outside and take a walk together. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> Fresh air. Spring is so lovely. Look around. What do you see? What do you hear? So I just said, what do you see? What do you hear? In this video, it's obviously dictated. But in real life, that question would be answered by a child, and then we would adapt our playing. Um, and so the idea, this is a musical scavenger hunt where children are moving, but they're also looking for things in spring. Um, but that doesn't mean um, it doesn't have to always be a, a scavenger hunt or going on a walk, or it can be you know, whatever you want it to be. But this is something I have since required my students um, to do as a part of their methods classes. And I've had many students actually um, come back to me telling me they used it in their field and in their student teaching and that they had a, a lot of really um, successful <laughs> runs of that. Um, Nate, since you do it at the Pittsburgh Symphony, um, can, do you want to talk a little bit about creating them or um you know how you've seen the kids react Nate is a pianist by the way um yeah sure so when we like make the lesson plan um like Dr. E said sort of like we make like sort of like a skeletal version of what we want and then when we get there um we sort of let the kids decide like what we're doing um so um the last two that we've done are the one that we're about to do the second one um, we are going on walks um the last one was trick-or-treating um so we talked about like going swimming through goo and um stopping at different houses and having like an obstacle at each one so we sort of like plan out you know like this is what's going to happen at this part of our story but then um based on what the students say we sort of just sort of go with it and um I usually am at the piano and then um, the, my other uh, friend, she's sort of running the room a little bit and we work together and sort of just make a story based on what the kids want. <laughs> and I just have found that this is something that you can pull out of your, you know, of your toolbox when you're working with any group of kids, whether it's a group of kids that you see weekly or if it's a group of kids that you've never met of all ages. Um, and it's really perfecting the art of observing and questioning, you know, having the right questions to guide the students and observing them in a way that you can then craft, um, whoops, what, what you're doing. Um, so I know that I'm running out of time, um, but I want, those are the big things, um, that I wanted to hit in, in the outline of sing, move, play. Um, these are just a few pictures uh, from we have a virtual experience that that we run for all of our um, all of the programs in Butler County in early learning connection. So that's a picture up there of the virtual experience. Um, we have community events that we run. So the same kind of sing, move, play experiences we do for uh, Halloween and um Valentine's Day, and then we have children's concerts similar to what the PSO does called Tuneful Tales. And um, these are some videos that we don't need to watch, but this is uh, essentially, there's from the Children's Museum for our Sing Move Play events that we do one a month. There's a picture from the Eurythmics Room. You can see how many people are in there and all, all ages. It's very exciting. Um, and so there's the information from for the different pages. So it's so good. I think, yeah, I think that that kind of sums up what I'm doing and the different projects. And yeah, hopefully there's some of so that. There's so much here. We could we could work with uh, we could we could probably program a whole degree like in music education with Dr. Eisenreich. I bet that was like a totally thing that could happen. And there's ready, like honey. enough content where- um, uh, it's not, Yeah, there's too, it's too much to talk about, but so exciting. It is really exciting. So can you just quickly list off how many different programs were there? There's something at the Children's Museum. 
which for yes. the people out of town and out across the country, that's a, a big museum here in Pittsburgh. Um, and there's something with the Pittsburgh Symphony, which is at a different venue at Heinz Hall with this world-class A-list symphony who sponsors concerts for children. And so you have a special room there where you do programming as part of that. That's two things. What else did you just show us? And then we run a virtual music program for early learning connections. So these are Head Start programs or government funded. So families who can't, you know, afford schooling. Um, so we, the, multiple classes come into our Zoom room. It's not one class, it's multiple classes come in there. Um, I hire students, I get grants and hire students to run those. Rachel, who's on the call here, um, was my lead teacher for the virtual sessions this past semester. Um, and then we do our um, weekly classes and that's with the on, we have an on-campus preschool at Slippery Rock. Um, one of those classes I run with my college students. Um, who are taking the field experience class, which is a required um, portion of our curriculum. And then the other two classes are co-taught by students who have, you know, who have taken that class and flourished and they run their own, th they, they have complete ownership over it. Rachel is one of those people, so. That's wonderful. There's so much, there's just so much here. Um, for anybody who's maybe new to the word Dalcros or haven't spent a lot of time in these circles, um, we we certainly do have a, a well-earned reputation for valuing motion and movement in our classrooms. Um, but the singing stuff, the part of sing, move, play, the singing and the playfulness, I would, I would like to emphasize are equal. Um, even though maybe what we're most famous for is all sorts of big body moving, um, uh, actually, the Dalcro's work began with solfege. Um, Jacques Dalcro's very first experiments were more singing experiments than they were moving experiments. And so singing should be central in all the work that we do. And it's something I'm so pleased to see presented today as a full third. Um, and this idea of playfulness, um, which I think you heard in a bunch of ways, just as Nate described, well, we have a sketch of a lesson plan. Like we kind of have a plan, like it's not like we didn't plan. And yet how very willing did he seem to be to abandon that exact plan in exchange for something that the students came up with. Um, and that I'll claim is an extremely Dalcrozian kind of mindset um, or philosophy when, when thinking about, well, wh why would we do a thing in this class? And it being led by students, student-centered, um, and the other thing that I really heard said, I'm trying to think what was the, maybe it was Nate's example, or maybe Cassandra had a different example at the end, but this idea that if a student comes up with it and then we do it, it, it not only is appropriate because it was student led, but it also um, validates the ideas of that child. And so the idea that the child is powerful, that the child's ideas matter, that their presence could sway the whole room to do a thing is a kind of is a kind of power that I don't believe every five year old experiences just by default. I don't think and everybody. They feel, yeah, they feel seen because they. If you are truly watching and you're truly observing and you're truly reacting and listening to what that child's saying, doing, they they realize very quickly that what they're doing matters and and that you are taking that you know you're taking their thoughts and their actions and you're validating them like you said and it, it is it's extremely powerful and and beautiful and exciting in the way i don't know if any if you all are not familiar with this it's pretty old but ken sir ken robinson has a video called um the way schools kill creativity or how schools kill creativity and he's charming and funny and brilliant. And it just makes total, it just makes total sense when you, when you watch it. But I would encourage you if you haven't had a chance to, to take, take a look. Putting the link in the chat, if someone didn't beat me to it already. Awesome. Yeah, and I can't stress enough that the importance of, and the magic of transitions. The that's quite good. Well, we have just a couple minutes where we, we will end uh, within seven minutes from now. Did anybody have anything else that they wanted to ask or comment? Or Nate and Rachel, you seem to be kind of in between. You're like part presenter, but also part attendee. And so I don't know if there's anything that any of you, but if anyone had anything else they wanted to mention or comment. There, there are so many ways we could take 
again, we could just spend hours with Cassandra. Um, I'm thinking about the entrepreneurship uh, short course that's coming up um, and just thinking those, those programs, I'm pretty sure every single one of the things that Cassandra just listed off didn't exist six years ago or eight years ago. I don't know how long you've been doing them all, but the, these are yeah. all things. Yeah. They, I'm old these, now, honey. Yeah. <laughs> but they came from nothing. They were not there. Slippy Rock as an institution didn't have this kind of community involvement before Dr. Eisenreich came on the scene. Um, and so, um, I don't know, do you want to offer, I'm not sure that this is exactly what you were thinking you would talk about, but do you want to offer any suggestions on how you made any of those connections or what, what's the, you know, how do you make those connections? How do you maintain those connections? Where is the, um, how is it that you've ended up in this position with so much? Well, oh man. Well, Stephen, you I feel like you should do a master con master class on networking because you're brilliant at it because you're just a kind and vibrant human and I think that that's honestly if you're kind and you're passionate about what you do <laughs> like I think that that's pretty powerful. I mean, you have to like people, that's for sure. Um, but if you're kind and you you're passionate about what you'll find a way to make, you know, make things happen for what you want to see in, in your community and, and in your life. I, I just read a book, a very, very powerful, very popular book called Atomic Habits. And um, yeah, I just, I think make, make it a habit to do, you know, to be surrounded by the people that, that like push you and make you better and that lift you up. And yeah, I think that's how you network with the kind of people that, that you want to be around and that you want to associate yourself with and that you want to build programs with and change lives with hopefully. So yeah, that do what Stephen Neely does and you'll, <laughs> and you will make, you, yeah, you, and you'll be fine. <laughs> I've been hundred percent back that. So <laughs> yeah. I'm to say that, but also um, Cassandra, I think your presence and your grace with which you do your things and the thought that you put into each step is super clear to the people you work with, whether it's on a daily basis or I, we get to hang out a couple times a year. And I think, <clears throat> you know, details matter in that way. Like you don't have to be perfect, but when you show up for other people, then they will not unsurprisingly show up for you. Um, and so that is like excellent, just role modeling that you're giving your students at all levels, but especially your college kiddos. Oh, thanks. That means a lot. Everything you all are saying, I just want to put you in my pocket and pull you out when I'm feeling sad. You can just give me all the compliments. <laughs> I, I do have something to add. Um, it's really important to like, I don't know, continue to show up for your students and to, um, I don't know, encourage them to be creative and encourage them to do things that they're maybe afraid to do. That's what Dr. E's done for me. And I have I feel like I've just grown so much as an educator, as a human, and just in general because of her and because of her, I don't know, confidence in me um, and her guidance. Oh, that's wonderful and well earned, I'm sure. Um, for again, for you all, but also for the people who will watch this video after, um, I I'll just want to point out. I, I try to point this out every time it pops up, so I'm sure I've made this statement like ten times in sixty five uh, meetups. But there's something about lesson planning here that shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, and so I think there, and it was kind of mentioned that there's a common or maybe the common model for lesson planning, as is taught in a lot of our universities, is kind of like you know come up with good ideas and then do them. Um, and so, uh, and that's not completely unreasonable. Um, and yet it doesn't in any way guarantee that your good idea was appropriate for the students today. And so having this opening, this flexibility, not to have not planned, but to have allowed, to not call it a failure for your plan to evolve is a really- It's a flow chart. Say it again. It's a flow chart. Yeah, you know, if you can just permit that that lesson plan to be allowed to evolve, then you don't have to you don't have to admit any kind of defeat, and it certainly doesn't make you a worse teacher. Um, it in fact you could claim it quite the opposite that no, no no yeah I came in prepared I had some ideas but then I saw that this certain student offered this opportunity and I I had the flexibility to go with it the technique the confidence the vision 
um, the recognition to be able to sort of build from there, um, which to me is really a mark of mastery teaching, um, which I'm sure that Rachel and Nate are already stepping into um, just the way that they're describing their work, mastery teaching, um, which is not the same thing as I planned out something that I knew would be successful the night before, and then I ignored everybody while I forced them to make it successful. But instead, I planned out a flow chart the night before, and then I was responsive and present in my own classroom. And, and as a result, I was spurred on to my own creativity. We, the students and I together, went somewhere neither one of us were quite sure where we were going to end up and then i'll just say for the the new teachers in the room and who watch this later there's been nothing more exciting to me than feeling like i was awake in my own classroom um anytime i get too much into my routines where i'm like nope i know the words i say i've basically memorized this script i've taught this lesson forty thousand times before watch me say these same words again i i never even I just, I just know what I say and I know what I do. Anytime I catch myself anywhere near that, I can also feel the dead end job shadow starting to fold over me. Um, and what I need to think <laughs> is, I mean, really, we've all met those, those educators who are just angry and sad and angry and are just like, how did I get here? And where is my life? And I don't feel vibrant in any way. It's, it's always wake up, get present. Who am I teaching? How can I pay attention better? How can I empower the students to help lead me somewhere new? And I walk away feeling so enlivened, nowhere near burned out. Um, and so using this kind of flowchart mentality is not only doing great things for your students. I'm telling you, it's doing amazing things for your future career, your ability to sort of stay energized in what you do. And Especially that if you are a, like a public school teacher what sometimes happens is you find something, well, any teacher really, you find something that works and you're like, cool, let's just go on autopilot now. Um, and there's nothing vibrant about that. Yep. That doesn't mean you have to like reinvent the wheel every year, but you have to stay reinventing because kids are always doing that. Kids, yeah. So, you know. Very good. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we invite Dr. Eisenreich to say hi. Um, hey, everyone, we are one minute over. I appreciate all of you so much. Cassandra, thank you so much for being here and giving, oh, sure. giving us you, some time. Um, Nate and Rachel, thanks for contributing. And uh, I'm telling you, I don't yeah. know if anyone's actually really told you, but you are hanging out with the best of the best. There's, You're not going to go to any institution anywhere and find somebody better than Dr. Eisenreich. Um, uh, she's the best. And so good job uh, landing a great position. Um, from <laughs> Emma and me and from Veronica, who, who we knew had to step out a little early. Thank you all for being here. Sign up for some master classes. Sign up for um, the short course uh, with Emma and Veronica. Um, if you need scholarship assistance for any of that, let us know. We do our best to help. Um, we'll and uh, we'll be back for the next meetup um, soon. Hold on, let's just quickly, I just wanna, unless someone else can tell me what's next. Someone say it out loud. Hold on, I'm coming. Um, too many tabs open oh yeah january 27 is arthur's um uh is arthur's master class which is going to be here before we know it which means that we have a meetup um probably on the nope not on the day i thought it was on, on the um we have 66 coming up on january 23rd or 24th depending where you are there you go the thank you oh there it is it's in the evening uh, evening for me um that's it thanks everyone we're going to thank you, Cassandra. Bye.